I want to talk a little bit about titration curves, kind of from a, a standpoint of of a kind of a graphical analysis first, and then I'll talk about it in terms of problem solving in a follow-up video. So we've been talking a lot about acids and bases and the strength of acids and bases, kind of how ions impact the acidity and basicity of solution. So I want to talk about what this looks like if I was to actually do a titration and if I have my handy, you know, pH meter, then I could stick that in there. And while the titration is occurring, then I would be mapping out the change in pH. So let's think about a titration. First of all, uh, titration is a method that we use to determine the concentration of an unknown. So we use a burette. There's kind of the whole setup. Um, it's a pretty common uh, technique in chemistry. If you've taken the chemistry class, then you've probably done a titration or two. You've probably experienced titration frustration. And a titration curve gives you the pH versus the volume of the titrant that you're adding. So let's just focus on the titrant, in this case being a base, and what we're trying to find the concentration of is an acid. So if we think about this from a graphical perspective, because we're scientists, so we're always thinking about things in terms of data, let's use a strong base. Let's say that um, our titrant in this case is going to be sodium hydroxide, and we know that that's a strong base. And we want to see the pH, this is of your solution, and how the pH of the solution changes. So the solution then is going to start off being acidic. So let's do this for a strong base, and let's talk about a titration curve here for a strong acid. So this could be something like, you know, hydrochloric acid, um, hydrobromic acid, something that's strong. And let's for now just consider that it's a monoprotic acid, just for ease of, of concept. So for strong acids, we know that they have a pretty low pH. So it would start off pretty low on the scale, and it's going to stay pretty low because it's mostly acid here. And now as I'm adding the base to it, my pH is going to start to go up. And at a certain point, there's a flip where I go from a really strong acid to the neutralization point. And then once I've added enough, then I end up with and I went maybe a little bit high here, but something kind of at the higher end of the scale. So if we have very concentrated sodium hydroxide, then we're up here in the 14 kind of range. We started off down here in the 1 kind of range, and we added, 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 and then we got to the point where it flipped. And kind of at this point, which again, I didn't draw this exceptionally well, at this point right here, this is what's called the equivalence point. And that equivalence point on a titration curve is where the concentration of your hydrogen, or the concentration of your hydronium, because we're thinking about this in solution, is equal to the concentration of your hydroxide. And functionally what that means then is that I have a neutral pH. If it's strong, right, that would be a one-to-one -one ratio of my hydrogen to my hydroxide. And at the equivalence point, then they're making as much water as they can possibly have. So this is, you know, neutralization, right? An acid-base neutralization reaction. And we can use, you know, your various indicators. Phenothaline is a pretty common one to, um, to see the visualization of that endpoint, of that equivalence point. Um, we can also use our pH meter, though, if we're thinking about this in terms of actual values. So if we think about the chemistry of what's going on here, if this is a strong acid, let's just call it HA, so a, just a generalized strong acid, when it reacts with my sodium hydroxide, which we said is going to be our titrant, remember our acid would be our analyte here if we're thinking about our vocabulary for titrations, then we react these two things together. When an acid and a base react together, the first product that always forms is water from the hydrogen from the acid and the hydroxide from the base. And then what's left over is the salt, which in this case is going to come from the cation from my base and the anion from my acid, which again, this capital A could be any anion. If this was hydrochloric acid, this would be sodium chloride. Now, 
we'd say the pH of this is going to be dependent on my products because at the equivalence point I have as much of this as as much of this so that gives me pure water which we know is a pH of about 7. Um, that changes of course with different temperatures but saying that we're doing this under lab conditions that's probably about right. And then now we have to think about our ions because remember that ions can impact the pH of our solution. So we need to say <laughs> bless me. We need to say what's going to happen when I put sodium in that solution with water. If I have a sodium in there, is that going to hydrolyze my water or not? And we say no, it's not going to. No reaction. And why is it not going to be a reaction? Well, that sodium, if we think about it as where does it come from, what would it want from that water, it would want the hydroxide. But it doesn't want to be sodium hydroxide because that's a strong base. So now we have to think about the anion. Would that anion want to hydrolyze the water? And we'd say, well, what is the anion interested in? It would be interested in the hydrogen. So would this form? Well, no, we said this was a strong acid. So there's no reaction here either. All right. So if there's no reaction here, then that means the salt has no impact on the pH either. So this equivalence point is going to be at about 7, pH is 7. I mean, of course, depending on the temperature of this thing, but if we're assuming we're doing this under room temperature kind of conditions, then it'd be at a pH of 7 if we have a strong acid reacting with a strong base. Okay, now, uh, an inquiring scientist might want to know, well, how would this look different if I had a weak acid with a strong base? So if we look at a strong base, here is our titrant. So let's use sodium hydroxide again. So how would this look different? So first of all, if we compare it to what we had with our strong acid, kind of think about where would we start on our pH scale? Well, if I have a strong acid, then I have a lower pH. If I have a weaker acid, I'm probably going to start higher up on the scale. So let's say we start about here at a pH of 3 instead. Now as I'm adding my titrant to my analyte, then I'm still going to see this rise. And then at a certain point, it's going to flip and then level off. And again, I'm still going to end up at about the same place. Again, my drawing on this is a little bit terrible. But if I have a strong base, it's still going to end up at a pH of about 14. If we're thinking about sodium hydroxide, if it's pretty concentrated, if it's not very concentrated, maybe it ends up kind of where mine is here at about a pH of 13. But I started higher on my pH scale because it's a weak acid. And I also have a shorter range here for this neutralization part when it flips from being all acidic to being all basic. So this is kind of a shorter range for a weak acid. range. It's a weird A. And if I think about where this is then, kind of where the equivalence point is, then I can see that it's shifted upward. It's shifted more towards the basic side. Well, an equivalence point means the same thing. That's where the concentration of my hydrogen or my hydronium is equal to the concentration of my hydroxide. So that still means the same thing for a weak acid or a strong acid, but the pH of that point is going to be slightly different because of the side reaction. So if we think about HA this time as a weak acid with our sodium hydroxide. Pardon the sniffles. Allergy season. All right. And the hydrogen from my acid and my hydroxide from my base is going to form water. That's what an acid-base neutralization is. And then here's my salt again. Now I no longer have a strong acid. So when I'm considering my salt and thinking about what these ions do in solution, 
then I can consider my sodium again on the question, do I hydrolyze water when I have sodium ions present? And again, the answer is no, because it's interested in the hydroxide, my hydrogen hydroxide here. It's interested in the hydroxide, but that's a strong base. So there's no reaction here, no reaction. But my anion in this case, and maybe I should have used a different letter to make that a little clearer, but we're saying that this is a weak acid. So we know that if we have an anion that comes from a weak acid, we know the Ka values for those are really low, meaning that this weak acid likes to form, it likes to be together. So this anion, when it sees water, is going to pull away the hydrogen and form or reform that weak acid. When it does that to my water, when it hydrolyzes the water, what's left over is my hydroxide ion. And that hydroxide ion that's left over is going to make the solution slightly on the basic side. Okay, so this kind of goes back to our conversations on the common ion effect and how ions affect the pH of a solution. So it depends on where they come from, it depends on whether or not they want to reform weak acids or reform weak bases, or if they're coming from strong acids and strong bases, because that's going to impact the chemistry, that's going to impact the equivalence point when we're talking about titrations. And in future videos, we're going to talk a little bit about the math that goes into actually calculating these exact pHs depending on the concentrations that we have to start off with for our titrations.